continue with our season of Thanksgiving uh, real quick. Uh, it just reminds me of the of joy. You know, um, first of all, uh, joy. The J for Jesus, we give thanks. The O for others. And of course, the Y for yourselves. So it's just a pleasure, you know, that God allows us uh, to worship. So you're all standing, and let's give it up to God.
who are singing next, would you go ahead and come up? While they're coming up, um, I hope you can have a seat. Um, we had a Thanksgiving program on Tuesday, and they had worked to, and sang several songs for our service, and it was really nice. But they're going to share a couple of the songs with, with you right now. Um, did you all have a nice Thanksgiving? Yes. 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 Yeah. Good. I did too. Um, is there anything you want to say that you're thankful for at this moment? Heaters. <laughs> Heaters. <laughs> You woke up. Service. Service. Thanks for every day that I'm here on earth. All right. Enjoy.
job, you guys. That was great. Thanks. Well, like Jen, I hope everybody, I trust that everybody had a great Thanksgiving holiday. And if you didn't, um, hang in there. We're, that's what we're all here for, to get through <laughs> the holidays as well as to uh, enjoy the benefits of them. Jeremiah chapter 23. Almost 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato said that those who are too smart to engage in politics are punished by being governed by those who are dumb. 2,400 years later, Friedrich Nietzsche, the brainchild of the God is dead theology, proclaimed that Plato was a bore, to which Russian author of War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy, remarked Nietzsche was stupid and abnormal. Now, I'm, sure, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but politics seems to bring out the worst in just about all of us. Journalists pontificate on how the public should vote and then chastise us for those that we elect as if we're to blame for their convoluted policies and coming up so short of their promises. I think former White House counsel Charles Colson put it best when he said, well, human politics is based on the premise that society must be changed in order to change people. It's people who must be changed first in order to change society, and I think he was right. Even though Jesus was called the Prince of Peace, and while God is known as the author of peace, the Bible really never promises anyone personal or social peace until either one of two things happens. Either people turn their lives over to Christ and experience the peace that Paul says surpasses all understanding, or Christ returns to bring the world to its ultimate conclusion by ridding the world of evil. Through countless years of human history from Plato to Nietzsche, citizens have, have pinned their hopes, and understandably so, on political solutions for problems ranging from terrorism to health care. I mean, you name it, and then we talk about it. Even now, America's hopes for peace and Places like Ukraine and prosperity over inflation are wrapped around divisive or, or uh, divisive, however you pronounce that, politics. I mean, it's, if nobody agrees, that's about all we can agree on is that we don't agree. But I've got to tell you that while I pray for our leaders, just as Scripture instructs us to do, I'm starting to think that our problems have just outgrown our solutions. So, you know, we're kind of in a fix. Call me a cynic. The humanity's track record for achieving peace through diplomacy or politics is, is less than stellar. After calling Abraham to leave his homeland of Ur and the Chaldees, which is like in the, uh, the, the peninsula there, the Arabian Peninsula there, where, or I guess it would be the Persian, or whatever called, a peninsula, God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants to be their God if they would be his people. That was the agreement. We talked about this in Sunday school as well. Of course, it wasn't very long before Abraham's descendants proved themselves wicked so that, uh, so in judgment for their sins, they were taken captive and enslaved in Egypt. And we've heard that story. After Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage by the merciful hand of God, he parted the Red Sea and provided a way for them to get through the wilderness. It fell upon the, sh the shoulders of Joshua to lead the people out of the wilderness and back into the promised land of Abraham. During the course of their settlement of the promised land, Joshua became an old man and really incapable of leading the people. So the Lord raised up a number of tribal judges, including Gideon from the tribe of Manasseh, Deborah from the tribe of Naphtali, and Samson from the tribe of Dan, in order to protect or provide protection for his people. However, the judges, like everything else, eventually proved themselves inadequate, so God called Israel's first real priest-like prophet, a boy named Samuel. And Samuel grew up to become God's leader of the tribes of Israel that unified into a single nation under the covenant of the Lord's promise to be their God. I mean, it's, it's just a classic tale. Under Samuel's leadership, Israel experienced tremendous progress from a scattered coalition of of Abraham's kinfolk to a cohesive population of God's chosen possessors of his land. 
But as Samuel got older, the people began desire to desire a more centralized state like those of other nations. And so the elders called a meeting and told him that it was time for God's people to appoint a king. Samuel knew that a king was not what God wanted for Israel, but the Lord reluctantly allowed him to appoint Saul as Israel's first sovereign king or ruler. Now, of course, at first the people were pretty happy. He was tall and handsome and all that kind of stuff. They were happy with God's concession, but eventually they'd live to regret it. Saul turned out to be a paranoid lunatic, and it wasn't long until God would call them David to replace him so that Israel could once again thrive and prosper in peace. And yet even David and Solomon who followed after him, wise as he was, would prove to be far less than flawless in their leadership of God's people. If you're getting a sense that it's sort of a roller coaster ride from you know one high to one low, you're right. I, I mean, it's just, it's... Uh, it's almost monotonous. From the time of Samuel, for some 400 years following his time, Israel would follow one foolish king after another into a number of civil wars, that is, wars between the north and the south of Israel. And by the time Jeremiah was called to prophesy around 600 B.C., the northern tribes had been taken captive by Shalmaneser, and the Assyrians, and these guys were a bunch of ruthless thugs, and the southern tribes would fall to the Babylonians, who were, who were worse than the Assyrians. Now, what was left of Israel at this time, as, as we come to the current situation that I want to get to, Israel was a, real, a, a mere remnant of God's chosen people. I, I mean, just the nation alone was a remnant, but even those within Israel who actually believed in God and were keeping the covenant to be faithful to their God as he was faithful to him, his people, was very, very small. And they're once again living as captives in a foreign land. It's, it's like you just don't learn. The politics of poor leadership had gotten Israel into the mess they were in and yet the people seemed to believe that politics would somehow get them out. But of course God had other ideas. In Jeremiah tech chapter 23, the Lord proposes an idea that was anything but political. It was a solution that overcame the people's problems based upon God's own divine covenant promise to raise up a righteous branch to restore his people once and for all. The days are coming, promised the Lord through Jeremiah in chapter 23, verse 5, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In other words, all these other things that we've tried, you've tried, I've tried, we've all tried, they just haven't worked out, this is going to work. Let's look at chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. In other words, the leaders of the people were a bunch of, well, near-do-wells. Therefore, verse 2, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have now bestowed have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. And once it's been declared, it's going to happen, no matter how repentant you may become, which usually you don't anyway. I myself, verse 3, will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. And nothing could have been further from these people's minds. They, they couldn't imagine being able to return to their land. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them. And they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. In other words, things are going to work out. The days are coming, declares the Lord, verse 5, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of the countries where he had banished them. Then they will live in their own land. An American politician was visiting a village in South America 
and asked the tribal chief what his people's needs were. And the chief said, sir, we have two really basic needs. First, we desperately need a doctor. We have a hospital, but we don't have a doctor. And hearing this politician immediately whips out his fancy American cell phone, and after speaking into it for a moment, he promises the chief that a doctor would arrive the very next day. Now that's taken care of, said the politician, putting away his phone. So what is the second need that your people have? And sir, the chief said, looking a bit confused, we have absolutely no cell phone coverage out here. If you've ever lied to someone, or, or worse yet, had someone lie to you, then you know how discouraging broken promises can be. You get to the point where you, you don't even believe anything anymore. The covenant that God had made with Abraham, or Abram really, stipulated that as long as the people, people were faithful to him, he would protect his people and be their God. The only stipulation was is they couldn't, they couldn't violate the covenant. Although Israel's relationship with God had included many memorable moments of spiritual victory and joy, even political progress. For the most part, the nation had been unfaithful and found itself in near ruin in Jeremiah's day. So through the prophets, God offered his people hope for yet another chance at freedom and liberty if they would just follow his plan. God's plan included these three essential demands. First was God's demand for reform of Israel's leadership which wasn't going to be easy. Nobody wants to lose their leadership job. Second was the demand for the restoration of God's lordship. In other words, I am God and you're not. And third was the promise of his redemption for the faithful, which just didn't seem like it was even possible. In speaking about the Christian church prior to the Reformation of the 16th century, historian Will Durant writes, the church had begun with the profound sincerity and devotion of Peter and Paul. What great guys these, I mean, the apostle Peter and Paul, I mean, these guys were great. But he goes on to say, she was now degenerating into a vested interest absorbed in self-perpetuation and finance. So when you talk about the dark ages or the middle ages leading up to the time of the Reformation, that's the way things were. Like Israel in Jeremiah's day, the Christian church in Luther and Calvin's day had become so self-centered and corrupt that God would have to intervene. The very leaders who were supposed to be preaching, preaching freedom for the captives and forgiveness of sinners had been scolding God's people for not giving enough money to the church and for not performing various requirements for what they called Catholic salvation. Like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, the bishop and bishops and peace priests <laughs> prior to the Reformation had become a self-righteous band of spiritual thugs beating God's people over the head with, the out with outrageous rules and expensive expectations. New Testament prophets of, of humble inspiration had become priests of powerful position and, and people found themselves overtaxed by the church laws, leaving them unforgiven by a church that demanded more than they could give. The security of knowing Christ and his promise of eternal life in the days of the Reformation had become an item for sale, available only through the penance system of what amounted to costly indulgences. To say that the New Testament church in the, in the 1500s, the Middle Ages, was corrupt would be like saying Jennifer Lopez and Kim Kardashian have had plastic surgery. And so it was in Jeremiah's day, a time when the very persons appointed by God to lead his people, the, the shepherds, exploited those self-same people for personal gain. You see, sin and corruption have a subtle way of creeping in to the most holy of human institutions. Israel's leadership in Jeremiah's day had become a class of self-serving political parasites willing to say or do anything to preserve their own power. Their leaders had made foolish diplomatic alliances. They'd sold their people out, basically. And the political aptitude of some of them bordered on complete incompetence. Now southern Israel had exactly what she'd asked for, a king, a guy named Ahaz. Ahaziah was his full name. And he, this guy was dull. This guy was dull. Now that things were falling apart, the people were asking God to intervene and help them out of their self-made mess. However, instead of bailing them out in a rapture of heavenly rescue, God's response to their rather desperate situation was to call for a complete and thorough reformation. I'd rather be bailed out myself. 
than have to clean up my act. In verses 1 through 4, Jeremiah describes God's plan for saving Israel, beginning with a shakeup of her existing leadership. The so called shepherds, who had been trading the blood of the people for their own prosperity, were in for a rude awakening once God's plan went into effect. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord in verse 2. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock and will bring them back to their pasture. In other words, Israel, the crooks you've allowed to take charge of my nation, who've been ruling from corrupt positions of idolatrous pride, will soon be replaced and you will no longer be afraid. You see, the people of God have a long history, a biblical history, of failing God's covenant, then calling upon him to rescue us from the consequences of our own sins. From Israel to the Reformation to today, we find that we've naively put our hopes into the kind of national or centralized leadership we think will help our families and churches. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily. I don't think there's anything wrong with voting for people and supporting those we believe will govern rightly. But there is something wrong with putting too much hope into politics and politicians. If we learn nothing else from our biblical past, it's that only God can restore a soul to eternal significance, and only God can revive a nation's sense of moral decency. All we can hope for in the meantime is for our politicians to have enough moral integrity <coughs> to abide by the covenant of our scriptures. And if they don't, don't vote for them. As God's people, we need to pray for our leaders to initiate true reform based on faithfulness to God because anything less, it just isn't going to last. In verses 5 and 6, God responds to Israel's predicament with this promise. The days are coming when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In other words, a king who will actually be a king. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. God chose the lowly things of this world, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Whenever the, the, the people that we vote for take office, we usually hope that things will be different. I mean, I do, you do, we all do. But then after a few weeks, we realize that no matter who's in office, the kingdom of humanity seems to stay about the same or get worse. For Israel, the command was to wait for the coming Messiah, the righteous branch in verse 5. Man, if we put as much energy into uh, waiting for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as we do into some election conversations, wow, what a church we have. God didn't expect them to do anything until he himself had approved of their reforms in order to initiate their restoration. Since God is perfect, he's holy, he's able to handle every bit of our trust in him, no matter how impossible the circumstances. I don't know how many times I've, I've heard somebody say, or I've said to somebody, well, gee, it just looks like that's impossible. That's, that's just no way. And somehow God makes a way. Meanwhile, governments and even church leaders aren't even close to perfect and have historically proven themselves unworthy of your uncritical trust. Before the new Israel, that's you and me, but for the new Israel, that's, for you, that's you and me, the command is to proclaim the righteous branch as Jesus Christ, the Lord of righteousness. The challenge isn't so much to reshape our world through social policies and public culture or popular culture, Oh, certainly we should be responsible citizens and, and uh, contemporary in our, our way of doing things. But our real call is to restore, restore faith and trust in God and expect the same from those who lead us. Although God had offered Israel hope for the future through the prophet Jeremiah, at this moment in historical history and scripture, the people were feeling pretty lousy about the way things were. I would venture to guess that uh, many were tempted to just give up, throw up their hands, and continue to follow the same old dumb shepherds that had gotten them into the mess they were in in the first place. Why not? That just means that it's almost comfortable to be in your misery. 
You see, a person's only hope for enduring life in today's world is to hold out a belief that tomorrow's satisfaction will somehow prove that today's miseries are worthwhile. It's called redemption. Which is life's ultimate proof that our present pains are somehow worth the fruits of our children's future for our children's future. That if we'll just invest ourselves into God's long-term plan of salvation one person at a time, the future of our present circumstances will take on greater depth of meaning. Eternal redemption comes only through God, and the way God has chosen to provide that redemption is through the sacrifice of his only son, Jesus Christ. And it always gets back to that. I'm here to tell you that investing your hope in anything or anyone else is a disappointment waiting to happen. When you remove the dumb shepherds in your life that have misled you from following God's plan, you will experience the beginnings of real hope and peace. Which seems like a coincidence because I'm retiring and this dumb shepherd is going the way of many old preachers. Recently I read a story about a biblical, or about the biblical scholar Matthew Henry. He's the one that wrote the, uh, uh, I think there's like five or six volumes um, of commentaries on the Bible. That while he was in London, he made a, met a lady of, of very high nobility, very wealthy, and they fell in love. And she went to ask her father if uh, she could marry Henry, and the father said, well, he's got no background, you don't know uh, where he's come from, that sort of thing. And she said, yeah, that, that's true, Dad, I, I don't know his background or where he come from, but I know where he's going, and I want to go with him. People around us may not understand why we insist upon following Jesus as his disciples. I mean, it just seems like everything is so chaotic and, and just uh, absurd. But our Savior's historical background and where he came from has been the subject of endless criticism and confusion as well as outright lies over the course of 2,000 years. And, and you just kind of wonder sometimes if even Christians believe it. We may not always be certain of his background, but we can know where he's going, and as for me in my house, we're going to follow him to the very end. Throughout this sermon, I've hedged and hinted, hinted that Jesus Christ is somehow our only hope nationally, individually, spiritually, and politically. The reason guys like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah in the Old Testament, as well as John the Baptist, Peter, and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, the reason they could put so much confidence in the Bible's promise of a Messiah like Jesus was because God himself had made that promise and they knew that if God said it, it was going to get done. Not only did God send a Messiah to save the world from self-destruction, but he himself was and is that Messiah. Matthew, in his gospel, calls him Emmanuel, meaning God, meaning God with us. This church meets here week in and week out to provide folks of this community an ongoing opportunity to meet and fellowship with the Messiah personally and publicly. Most of us have experienced the healing forgiveness of God's grace through Christ, but sharing it with others makes it all the more worthwhile. As a kid, Edward Moat grew up neglected, spending much of his time on the streets while his parents managed a pub. In London, he was one of those latchkey kids, although I don't even think he had a latch or a key. He said of his younger days, uh, so ignorant was I that I didn't know where that there was a God. But at the age of 18, he heard God's word and it changed his heart, changed his life. He was baptized and went on to lead a successful career as a cabinet maker. But later in his life, after becoming a pastor at age 55, he wrote the song on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand in 1834. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy on Jesus' name. He really understood, or had come to understand, what life was all about. And what it's all about is coming back to the cross where we understand that, especially during Christmas time, there is this uh, message that God is trying to get to us, that, that all the disappointments we've had, all the times we've, we've thought it was going you know, to turn around, things were going to get a little bit better or whatever, that those disappointments were intended to bring us to a point of trusting in him and realizing that he would never disappoint us. 
my prayer is, is if you've never made a profession of faith in Christ, that even today you would repent of your sin, that is trying to follow shepherds that aren't worth following, and uh, come to him in personal, in a very personal way. And he will give you the life that is everlasting. If you would stand with me for a word. Lord God, your Bible is rich with so much, uh, oh, I don't even know what the right word is, uh, I guess information or knowledge, certainly wisdom. It's just jam-packed. And sometimes it's hard to, to kind of sort out the, what we need to know or need to keep in our minds in order to, to really understand our relationship to you. But I, I, I keep coming back to the cross and to the resurrection of Christ because it is the central focus of Genesis to Revelation. It is the promise that you've made that ultimately our lives will have made sense because we put our trust and our faith in you. We've got all kinds of evidence of people who've put their trust in all kinds of things and it just never works out. And I pray, dear God, that today we would renew our covenant with you, a covenant that's just dripping with grace, where you've spoken to us out of your love and affection for us and called us to be your people as you so graciously provide protection and meaning and, and purpose by being our God. We thank you for this time of Christmas and the season that we're about to celebrate in thanksgiving for all that you've done. That you, Lord, would receive our worship and our praise because we do love you and want to give you the very best that we have to offer. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. It's our custom at Calvary to provide you with an opportunity to respond to this day's worship. Maybe God is speaking to you for the first time and you know that, uh, that this uh, you know, makes sense or in some way resonates it sort of stirs up some common sense within your heart and so you need to respond and so we, we provide this time of public, uh, public uh, invitation for you to do such to repent of your sins to ask Christ into your heart but maybe even right where you're at to just simply uh, spend a couple seconds a few seconds with God I, you know that, uh, this is my favorite part of being pastor is to just stand before God's people with my mouth shut and my, my heart open along with all my brothers and sisters to just pray for, well, for the impossible. That someday, somehow, it's all going to work out because of Christ who took away all the disappointment when he bore our sins on the cross. As Jenna plays, I'll be here at the front. It's not the, your committee. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering who else yeah. is showing up. But well, is that an open meeting? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome to attend. You just can't vote. So we just have to vote. Keep your hand down. Uh, and anyway, uh, we, we uh, go ahead, Oscar. Yeah, a lot of stuff going on as usual. Uh, it's all in the bulletin. Uh, another thing, uh, annual membership meeting on December 18th. And, of course, tonight we have Truth Project. And I noticed a Christmas program already coming up and another potluck. And don't you guys see that at home? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> we feed each other more than one way here at Calvary. We are so blessed. Amen. Anything else, Janet? Yeah. Hey, uh, anybody? Miguel, Miguel, as our ushers come forward and make their way. Yeah, we have uh, the outreach coming up, Miguel. Yeah. Uh, next Saturday, we'll be taking the, uh, some people already uh, donated some clothes and stuff to the, um, 
you know, brought it here to the church. So next Saturday we'll go out there and feed them and uh, and take the clothes that. But you still have, you know, what I mean, all week. If so, if you have something, you haven't looked through your closet or whatever, you know, what I mean, let's do this so we can have enough, you know, to take. Because there's quite a bit of homeless, coming you know I mean, back there behind Home Depot and maybe some other spots. But uh, so if you can, you know, donate. Thank you. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, being so good to us, Father. Thank you for always blessing us, Lord, always giving us more than we need, Lord. Bless this church, Father, and uh, bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah.